Hey, what's up guys, Mendel here. So today we're gonna to start with part one of mixing metal drums, which is routing and balancing. So as always, let's dig right in. Well, let's talk about drums for a bit. So I'm a big sucker for modern fat punchy drum sounds. I grew up listening to mix from Andy Sneed, Colin Richardson, Jens Bogren. Uh, I'm really into David Taro's mixes, Chris Donaldson, Just Wilbur. How could I forget about that one? Big, fat sounding modern metal drums. So I just wanted to let you guys know if you're really into that old school vibe, which more darker sounding and not really a lot of transient or snap, then perhaps you might still learn something. Also, I wanted to tell beforehand, drum mixing is really, really subjective. So the things I'll do here, um, perhaps some things take with a grain of salt. This is how I like to do things. I would say, besides watching this video, do your own research and pick things out that you like that could participate in your own sound, whatever that may be. In the end of the day, in my opinion, mixing is an art form. So, and as in every art form, it's subjective. Now, some of you might think, why is there a video about the routing and the balancing of drums? It's all about mixing, right? And I say clearly no. First of all, a good workflow slash routing improves the whole mix. At least it did it for me. It makes everything easier. I get in this flow that's way faster to work with, but I can also reach my goals way faster, which makes it more fun to mix, which back then results into better results if that sentence makes any sense. And besides that, balance is so important. I remember when I started mixing, like my snare was way too loud and my kick drum was way too loud and it was really weird listening to it. And I'll admit, sometimes it's still a bit too loud because I really like the kick and I really like the snare. That's like so important to me and then like in a the metal mix. But the more I started to focus about the balance, I kid you not, the better my mixes became. So. Let's go to Cubase. All right, so here we are in a beautiful program called Cubase. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, so I recorded some guitars and we have some bass and here are the drums. So I'll just show the song first and then we'll dig into all the good stuff. So here we go. All right, so pretty cool if I may say so myself. So let's take a quick listen to the drums, just a short bit, and then I'll balance from the ground up. Cool, all right, so let's dig into the routing. So first of all, um, every time when I mix, uh, or in my mixing templates, I have everything in folders, which is a great function in uh, Cubase. I love folder tracks. So uh, let me just give it all the same size. There we go. Uh, so kick and snare, snare sample, snare bottom, and room sample. And all of these go into the kick and snare group, except for the room sample. And I'll talk about it a bit later. They have hi-hat, which goes straight to the drums group. We got the toms, and they go to the toms group, and the toms group goes to the shells group. Oh, and by the way, the kick and snare group goes to the shells group as well. Shells is like everything that's not symbols, basically. Then the ride goes straight to the drums group. China splashes, overheads goes to the symbols group. And then we have a cl uh, room close mic, a room far mic goes to the room group, and the rooms group goes to the drum group. Now, for an example, 
why would I do stuff in groups? Sometimes I like to treat um, um, treat shells as groups or just to kick and snare as groups. For example, with compression, it depends on the project. I'm not doing it in this project because there's some stuff going on with parallel compression which I'll dig in. So as I said before, I have like the room sample that goes straight to the drums group. I have the hi-hat that goes straight to the drums group and I have the riot that goes straight to the drums group. Why is that? So for example, with the cymbals, you could say a riot is a cymbal and it should go to the cymbals group. But since the riot does have a sort of a percussion element to it or a transient element to it, like when uh, like a metal will really like the bell ride. You can't see my hand here. We really like the bell ride. And since I compressed the cymbals with a very short attack, the transient, like that right transient, kind of gets lost if I do it with the, if I ride it to the cymbals group. That's the reason the ride goes straight to the drum group. Same thing with the hi-hat. I like to treat the hi-hat on its own with its own kind of compression, uh, perhaps even some de-essing on it. Um, so I can treat it more on its own instead of doing it to the group. Also, the, the hi-hat also has like a certain percussive element to it because the drummer can like when the hi-hat's closed and does some rhythms to it, I don't want that attack being lost by the compressor that I put on the cymbal group. So this setup makes sense to me. Kick drum, snare, the toms, then like the, the overheads and stuff, and then the room mics. Now at the bottom here, you see two FX channels. Actually, this has the wrong name because this is room works. So we have a reverb here for the drums and the Cubase Paracomp, which is short for parallel compression. Depending on the project, but personally, I really like parallel compression. So on the reverb channel, I like to use the Roomworks, which with this setting sounds pretty good, and the Cubase Paracom. Now, before this video, I actually never used uh, this compressor on uh, on drums. And for this video, I was checking like the different compressors. Like this, is the vintage compressor. You have the normal compressor, and I think you have a tube compressor. Compressor. But to be honest, this thing blew my mind, and you'll hear that in the in the drum mixing video absolutely stunning compressor, especially for drums, really snappy, good for metal drums, in my opinion, but I'm in love with it. So the parallel compression only goes to the shells. Personally, I'm not a big fan of using um, overheads on parallel compression because for me, um, like perhaps most of you like this, a lot of times when um, mixers and perhaps even non-metal mixers use parallel compression, they have like a very early attack, uh, very early release and doing a lot of compression and they blend that in. And I personally never, never liked that sound. I always wanted to have more snap. The tranche needs to pop through like the snare and the toms and the kick need to pop through those heavy guitars and the bass guitars. So personally, instead of doing like an early attack, I like to do like a late attack on some compressors like around 10 milliseconds, perhaps 30. On this one, I had like almost around 60. Early release, the mix on a uh, 100%, and then I'll blend it in with the volume here, which I'll show in the mixing video. Now you could say, Mendel, why wouldn't you put this just on the drum screw bus or on the, on the shells bus, and then use the mix knob? Like some plugins have that, and this plugin has it as well. Well, that's pretty simple. I don't like to have equal compression on all the shells. For example, um, you can see it here. So the send to the Cubase Paracom is minus 10, but on the snare and on the rest of it, it's zero. And sometimes I even put like uh, a bit less on snare and then a bit more on toms, depending on the project. But this way, by using the parallel compression as an FX send, with the sends, I can choose per channel how much I want to compress in that. And I would not have that option if I would put this on the drums group or on the shells group. So to sum that up, basically it's control. By having that parallel compression as an effect send, I can just like say, okay, so kick minus 10, perhaps the, the small tom minus eight, maybe the lower toms, which can really slam the compression, maybe a bit less compression. Depends on taste, but that's how I like it. All right, so now I'm gonna put everything on zero and then I'm gonna balance everything 
from scratch. So there we go. So I'll leave the group channels all on zero. And now let's dig into some balancing. So personally, I always like to start with uh, my symbols. So let's get a section to loop. There we go. which I like to do after symbols. Now this is a thing mostly based on taste. So if I would do like the kick and snare really loud and the symbols really low, it would give a totally different vibe. And it could be a, a cool thing. For example, when you listen to, um, what's that band called again? For example, when you listen to a band called uh, Bring the Horizon, they have an album from 2013, Septim something like that. And on some songs, the symbols are really low, but the kick and the snare are really loud, but it works really well for that song. But some other albums, like metal albums, if you want to have a more natural vibe, the kick and the snare are a bit more balanced with the overhead. So it's all comes to taste. And like I said before, the things I do here, take it with a grain of salt. Anyway, so let's continue with the kick here. Like that, and we blend the snare. I think I forgot to turn off the, the reverb. I like the balance without the parallel compression and without the reverb. I'll add those in later. So let's add in the snare sample. Add in the room. Sorry, I mean the the bottom. One important thing to notice, by the way, about the bottom mic. So a lot of times, um, when people have issue with this, because the mic is like flipped the other way around, the polarity can be switched. So when I listen to the snare, I'll flip the face, but sometimes it could be out of phase, and you have this. When I flip it. It adds some bottom. So always make sure like with every, like all the mics, even with the overhead mics are, are in phase or like aligned with the, with the snare. I like to do that most of the time when mixing drums. And let me tell you a secret. Most of the time when I mix metal, I don't use bottom snare at all, but that's just my taste. Okay. So let's add the snare room sample. I think I like it better without it. So now I'm going to the room tracks and let's see how that sounds. are pretty good. Now let's loop the section where if the tom fills so we can blend in the toms. I forgot to add in the hi-hat. Before I go to the toms, let's go to some ride. I think it's right over here. 
this part. that now let's go back to the toms Now I'm going to a part where we have the second floor tom. Okay, so that sounds pretty good to me. Let's take a listen from the beginning. Okay, pretty happy with that. So before I forget, these drum samples are already panned. So what I normally would do, uh, when I have overheads, uh, I would do overhead left, hard left, overhead right, hard right, and then also check where the snare sits. Sometimes not always in the middle, and I try to get the cymbals as wide as possible, but also the snare is most in the middle. Rooms, far left, far right, kick center, snare center, snare sample center, that all center. And then the toms, it depends how many toms there are. Now, for some reason, metal drummers really like their toms and they wanna go full mic port and get 200 toms. Um, I do not like uh, having like the, the small toms all the way to the left and the floor all the way to the right. Sometimes I have the small toms like around 20 or 25. It really depends how it also sounds with the overheads, like where the toms are. But mixing wise, I always like to mix from the drummer's perspective because I'm always like air drumming the stuff. And the right, most of the time I have it around 50. It, it really depends where it sits in the, like the stereo spectrum. But for this, I'm pretty happy how this sounds. Now for the sake of balancing, let's add in some bass. So I'm pretty happy with that. So this I would do before starting mixing the drums, like balance the drums, how they sound pleasant to my ears, add in the bass, add in the guitars, and then the vocals, and then uh, I'll go mixing. I'm just gonna check it one more time, just, in, just to be sure. Cool, I really like that. Sounds balanced to me, ready to be mixed. So, if you have any questions about this whole procedure, please leave them in the comments. I'll try to answer every question you have. And uh, see you in the next video that we can finally start mixing some metal drums. See you next time.